Hi, welcome to GM Vault, and today we're going to be talking about how to create an encounter that creates a story your players will never forget. That is, each encounter, every one, because it takes so long, creates a story and a memory for all of your players. Thanks for listening. Okay, here's the truth. The truth is, encounters, combats, can take a very long time. Even if they're just three or four rounds in a typical RPG, an encounter, because of its complexity, can last sometimes an hour and a half to two hours in game time. Some have lasted longer. Epic encounters with player character groups of four to five to six players and multiple adversaries can take hours to complete. So let me emphasize this point. If you aren't thinking through your encounters thoroughly and strategizing how they can be interesting, you are really <clears throat> missing one of the best things that you can do as a game master. You're, you're losing out on an enormous amount of time that could become incredibly memorable for your PCs. Why? Well, a lot of times whenever we create our encounters, I mean, even if they're interesting monsters, uh, they tend to be hack and slash. And random encounters, as silly as they are, you roll the dice, they're out in the wilderness, you're in a dungeon, and some orcs come around the corner, even those can last 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes longer. And they have no real bearing on the story. So the key for you as a game master is to think through your encounters as though they are stories. That's right, the encounter is a story. In a way, you could think about it like a cinematic battle or an encounter in a movie. Like um, the hero and the villain have to interact and then they have this sort of tense conversation. Uh, one of the heroes say um, they had this moment in the wilderness where one of them says, Hey, Fred, I really want that ring. No, you can't have the ring. The ring doesn't belong to you. If you take the ring, it will corrupt you. You can't try to do this now. But if you'll just let me borrow the ring, then I can use it for good. You can't use it for good. It can't be used for good. It must be destroyed. No, I believe that I myself can find a good use for it and that we can defeat evil and then, then we can destroy it. And then Fred says, if you, if you try, you will be destroyed. But I, I must try, and the villain is overcome with insanity and attacks, and the combat begins. There's a back and a forth, and, you know, the weaker opponent, poor Fred, is trying his best to squirm his way out of several sticky situations with Bernard. Bernard, the adversary, he was once a, a friend, is now a foe. It becomes a story unto itself, this memorable moment where poor Fred and Bernard have fought over this ring, and uh, Bernard, who was once a friend, is now a foe, and oh gosh, it's going to get worse from here, because there's a huge battle coming, that's going to take even longer, and then in the end, poor Bernard sacrifices his life for his comrades, just racked with guilt, that he didn't protect poor Fred, that he betrayed his oath, oh my goodness, that is a story within a single encounter. And that's what you should be trying to do as a game master. So how do you do that? And how do you keep from wasting 30, 45, an hour, an hour and a half, two hours of the very precious time that you gain with your players every single week with a non-story based encounter? So that's what I'm going to walk through today. And I'm going to show you an example of how I do it with a sort of outline that I use within my uh, online RPG campaign manager. Now, you can do this on a piece of paper. You could do it in your notebook. It doesn't really matter. But you should probably think through these things. And I'm going to say this up front. I am not going to tell you anything that other smarter people haven't thought of before me. Uh, that's a fact. So I will start with... Somebody I highly admire, and I highly recommend going and watching this video. The link is down below. You should definitely check it out. Matt Colville, uh, some time ago, did a terrific video called Action-Oriented Monsters. 
brilliant idea. And all it does is it basically says, if you're going to create an encounter, whether it's with a group of goblins or a, a really powerful mummy, it doesn't matter. You should think through the various things that the monster will do during the combat, which creates a cinematic, climactic, powerful, with a uh, experience where the tension continues to rise round by round, creating this memorable experience for your player characters. Now, how do you do that? Well, all he simply does is he thinks through some of the things like bonus actions, reactions, lair actions, and villain actions, which are really cool. Those are simply actions that your villain does that are ticked off as the rounds go by. Round one, the villain is going to do this, call in reinforcement. Round two, the villain is going to do that, uh, pull down the stalactites from the ceiling, uh, crashing down on the player character's heads. And then round three, just before death, the villain is going to do something spectacular and powerful, right? It adds this cinematic quality to the combat itself. And then I'm going to steal. And when I say steal, what I mean is really smart people borrow great ideas, but I think geniuses steal. And so I try to do that as often as possible, but I always give credit where credit is due. Matt Colville had this brilliant idea of the action oriented monster. And then this terrifically intelligent person, the Angry GM, whose website you should definitely go check out, has an entire series of blog posts on building great encounters that also will be linked below. You should check those out. And what I learned from both of these approaches is to create a story-based encounter. So if you've got an action-oriented sort of story-based combat, you can also create an action-oriented, a story-based encounter where you think through some additional ideas, namely the dramatic question, the Role-playing notes, things that you write out ahead of time to remind yourself this is how this encounter is going to progress. If it progresses to combat, great. If it progresses to a negotiation, terrific. If it progresses to we move on and agree to be uh, enemies or foes or agree to disagree over this particular issue, fine. But when Bernard attacks Fred, you know when that's going to happen during the conversation that happens as Fred and Bernard are discussing whether or not he should take the ring or shouldn't take the ring and break his oath, right? Um, you're going to write that down. Terrain notes, key, key, key. And this is essential to those layer actions if you're going to add those to your creature. So you can see how those two things are connected. The villain actions get connected to your role-playing notes. Your layer actions become intimately connected to your description of your environment and your um, terrain notes, which may, for example, be something like this is a crowded hall uh, where feasts happen. There are chairs everywhere and tables everywhere so this is difficult terrain when you're trying to move around this or negotiate that area so even without a map you can describe to your characters that they need to make a, a skill check and now suddenly our encounter our combat the entire conversation can become more than just hack and slash instead it's also utilizing their various skills to move about the location or perhaps the villain has some things prepared in advance. Um, things that the villain can do like uh, trigger some traps or call in some additional support. That can be done in the layer. So you can write that down in your terrain. So it's really an organized method of thinking through the terrain, your role-playing notes, a combat that is action-oriented, and then I make sure to add a resolution at the end. How is this or what are the various ways that this combat or encounter can resolve, right? And I make sure to write that down so I keep in my head before I get there because a lot of times I'm trying to prepare a way in advance for this. Uh, how, how can it resolve? I also always forget to put in loot. And so I'm usually improving. You find 333 gold pieces. Uh, I try not to do that anymore. I make sure to make a note about what loot, if there is loot available after this story-based encounter. But... All of that begins with the dramatic question. What is that? The dramatic question is simply this. You write a simple sentence or two that describes what the player characters must do that invests them into this mini story, this chapter, this scene in your role-playing game. It could be something like 
can the player characters capture the assassin before the assassin can kill the hostage? That's pretty straightforward. It could be, will the player characters release the cursed skeleton lord uh, and uh, be able to defeat him so that his shame is forever forgotten by his ancient god? Uh, will the player characters be able to negotiate their way into the bank and uh, attack the corrupt banker who has stolen the townspeople's goods? Can the ships flying through this galaxy uh, make their way past the enemy ships and land safely on the planet without being attacked? Right? These sorts of dramatic type questions must raise the tension and it gives you a way to invest the players in why they're going about entering this encounter and taking it seriously enough to give it their best shot. Again, we're going to back up for just a second and remind you why you would do all this work as a game master. Why not just roll a random encounter and say goblins come around the corner and you fight and that's fun and you're rolling dice and that can be exciting in and of itself. Role play versus role playing, right? Role play versus role playing can be fun. This just adds that story element to make it more interesting because you only get so many hours with these people every week. Two, three, four, maybe five, if you're lucky, hours once a week is all you get. And when combat is going to take up 30 to 50% of your game, you should think it through in a story based approach. Okay, I'm going to show you how I do this in a story-based outline online. Okay, I said I would show you one of my notes where I actually uh, wrote down how I kept in mind these steps for an action-oriented combat encounter. Now, there's a couple ways you can do this. I started off with this as an event, an encounter event, uh, because I have that saved as a template, which I will show to you in just a second. But I actually changed this into a character when I was done with that uh, scenario, that campaign, that adventure that we played in my campaign, uh, because I, I like him. Uh, I, I like this character. And of course, uh, you know, Captain Bagrash is dead. Actually, he's been dead for a few thousand years, but he's undead and fully dead now, right? So I actually went up here to the gear, uh, uh, and I'm in scabbard, of course, and I, I went to change page type and uh, converted this from a encounter into a character, uh, and then I added in a lot of the connections for a character. So you can see here is now the leader of the Fortress of Je Jelen Tak, uh, and uh, he's a lawful neutral fighter, male, hobgoblin, villain, so on and so forth. He was dead at the time of the fight. All right, so as I said, the first thing that I start with is a dramatic question. And I want to answer that dramatic question before I ever start creating the encounter because I want it to feel like this epic story that's being told within the course of the combat. It is a story and a combat. It's a twofer, right? So you have the, will the players be able to defeat Bog, uh, Captain Bogrash and end his watch forever? Um, giving it some sort of dramatic feel like they're, by fighting this guy, there's almost an act of compassion that they are engaging in, all right? The environment description, uh, I keep that in there because it, this was initially an encounter. Yeah, you may not have something like that. The environment description for your creature, if you're going to write up your action-oriented monster that way, that's fine. I Again, I started with this as an event, an encounter, and so I have an environment description there. And it just describes this grand hall that uh, Captain Bagrash's spirit has lain at rest in, in sorrow and depression for not fulfilling uh, his oath to his uh, great uh, heroic leader, Jalantak, who died many, many years ago and founded their order, right? In the role-playing notes here, you'll see uh, I have here a uh, Bagrash will question the PCs for a short time, and then he will request to battle them in honorable combat to end his sorrowful, cursed existence. He will tell the PCs the last group that visited him refused to fight him out of respect. If even a single character says they want to fight, the combat begins. He will always focus on a single PC during the combat until that PC is unconscious. And then the captain will also give a history of the fortress if asked. So if before the combat, they start engaging him about the room and what is all this place and where did all this come from and how did you get here? He will, in his undead voice, begin to tell them because 
you know, why not? Um, and the next section there, I mentioned uh, uh, that I always try to put some terrain or environment challenges. This takes place in the Grand Hall of Captain Bagrash in the Fortress of Jalantak. Uh, it's low light, partially obscured in the corners of the room. So if we've got a rogue in the group, uh, that rogue may want to stick over there and shoot his arrow out and get advantage. Uh, or also, uh, moving around the room, uh, the furniture uh, is difficult terrain. So there's chairs, there's tables. That's going to be treated like difficult terrain, so they're only going to be able to move half movement. It's not a wide open space, okay? Um, how will the encounter resolve? Uh, that is something that I like to stick in an encounter because I like to keep in my mind, how is this thing going to finish up? You don't always have to put that in there. In fact, you could actually put that in the villain actions for your adversary. That would be just fine too. How is it going to finish up? Bagrash will fight until he reaches 20 health and then he will yield and call to Jalan Tak to release him from his oath. Um, Captain Bagrash, here we have the basic stuff that you would find in a normal character, right? So you have his name, you've got large, undead, lawful neutral, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, you'll notice I don't even put the stats in. This is for obviously Dungeons and Dragons. I don't even put the stats in. I just put the pluses in in case I, I need to roll for one of these. Um, and then I put in some resistances, uh, resistant to non magic weapons, fire and cold, so on and so forth. This is the normal stuff that makes a combat encounter interesting or challenging for your, uh, player characters, right? But then I've got his actions, right? So we've got three actions uh, that he can take per round, plus a shield bash, three great sword attacks, uh, one die eight plus two there, uh, slashing damage. So I, I actually lowered the damage down because this is a lower level group. And instead of doing a massive amount of damage each and every hit, I lowered a little bit because I didn't want to wipe them out in just two rounds. And then the shield bash, which has an extra uh, one die six plus three bludgeoning damage and DC 12 dex or fall prone. Right, so we have our right basic actions, but now we, we add our other three categories to make this villain interesting. Bonus actions of shove, a battle cry as he cries out to his long dead leader to uh, you know for victory in this last and final battle to release his soul a second wind uh, he can uh, and remember it's just one of these per round if his uh, you know um, hit points are getting a little low he can cry out and get that basic second wind that a fighter gets except he can do it multiple times during the combat okay reactions deflecting arrows somebody starts to shoot from or this is a melee guy so he's going to be whacking away with his sword um, and and if somebody starts to shoot him, he's got a deflect arrow reaction, and then a disengage. If he, if the uh, the captain gets flanked, the the captain will uh, disengage and then move between two columns and throw a weapon rack at one of the player characters, which they then have to dodge or take some damage and lose their attack next round, getting out of these uh, old decrepit, rusted uh, spears and and halberds that have been stored in this uh, large hall. Right. So it's just one piece of. Uh, <laughs> strategy that will now engage that player other than just I run an attack. It's now I have to deal with a weapon rack that has been thrown at me and get out of it. And then I have my two villain actions. I mentioned you do not have to have three. I only had two. Uh, one is restore health, which is when two PCs are knocked unconscious, he calls on his ancient, uh, um, you know, primal, heroic uh, saint, and asks the saint to heal them and bring them back because he wants this to be an epic fight and that was too fast, right? I thought that'd be kind of fun. So to sort of an invert on the villain action, he wants to bring them back to make this fight even more epic so his soul can be satisfied. And then the ground slam, which is that final villain action when he's uh, down to 20 hit points, he slams his shield on the ground, knocking back everything in the room, knocking everything over, one die 10 points of damage, and you have to, you know, make a... Uh, a, a save to stand on your own two feet as he kneels down and says, I yield. An epic ending to this epic battle. Okay, so how did I get here? Well, I mentioned before that I created an encounter and then eventually transformed that into a character. Not hard to do inside the system, but I wanted to show you what I created here because you might find it of value. It is actually on the content and uh, exchange if you'd like to check it out. All right, so I go up here to events, just click the new button there and you will see this pop up. And I've got uh, a couple in here. One is for sort of common session logs that I use every time. And then the other one is just a blank new event. The other one is the encounter template. And I click on that and we'll just call this new encounter and clone. 
And it's gonna take me to that cloned page, but I wanted to show you what, what I've done to just sort of remind myself to walk through these same questions. I've got the dramatic question in here, role-playing notes, terrain environment challenges, how will the encounter resolve? A basic setup for a big creature, but I don't always have to have an air. I've got real villain actions, reactions, bonus actions. I didn't actually put layer actions in there because sometimes I put those up here in the terrain and environment challenges, but it doesn't really matter how you do it. I also, by the way, have down here, you'll notice I've got stats and it says items, money, and other. I always forget to put in loot. So sometimes in an encounter, I will uh, use that to remind myself to stick it in there. Okay, I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. I really do. If you watched it all the way to this point, remember down below, you're going to find links to a bunch of different things. Matt Colville's amazing video. The Angry GM's series of blog posts on encounters, also totally worth your time, as well as links to the pages that I showed you in my video. Now, those are from my personal campaign, but you're welcome to check them out. And uh, in addition to that, I highly recommend checking out the Content Exchange, which is on Scabbard RPG Campaign Manager because I've taken that template for an encounter and loaded it up into there so anybody who has an account with Scabbard can clone it into their own campaign if you want. Not, not that you would want to. The most important thing that you do is that you find a piece of paper, you find another campaign manager or Scabbard RPG campaign manager, and you do something like this for your significant encounters. Create stories, make them interesting, Get, give them action-oriented combats and give them environment descriptions, role-playing notes, a resolution notes, and a dramatic question to make them tense, climactic moments that bring catharsis for your players and make your campaigns memorable. That's what makes it fun for me, and I hope that's what it makes it fun for you. We'll see you next time. This is Eric, and you are watching GM Vault. GM Vault.